And welcome back to episode six of Mind the Back Chat. And today we are myth busting yet again, episode two of Mythbusters. But this is episode six of our podcast. <sighs> My mind is blown. Yeah, 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 yeah. It's just, it's just moving. It's just how it works, isn't it? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, we are a little bit rusty, I'm not going to lie to you, just simply because of how long it has been since we have recorded. Because of the New Year's break and the Christmas break and whatnot, we had stuff to do. Train trains. Um, yeah, painful, painful. But they've stopped, they've stopped, which is a great thing. For now is the key word with that one. Yeah, we, oh, you know Let's what? Let's not get into the myth about the trains. Exactly, exactly. Do they deserve a raise? We are not going to get into that whatsoever. Will they turn up to take me to work? That's another question I have for them. Anyway, doesn't matter because we're not here to discuss that today. Exactly. We'll leave that to the political side of things. Yeah, and what they can leave us to is the clicking. Now, George, the first myth of the day, will clicking give you arthritis? No. Good. Like, that's, that's a very common question, isn't it? Is like, um, if I crack my fingers, I'll get arthritis. My mum used to tell me it all the time when I was younger. Mm. And primarily just because I think parents find it annoying more than anything. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's the same sort of thing as um, my sisters used to uh, chew, have chewing gum and then they used to uh, do bubbles and just pop them. Do, do you know about that? Does that give you arthritis? No, 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 <laughs> but it was the most annoying popping sound. Yeah, so oh, uh, yeah, no, I, it, I it's, it's, a, it's a comparative kind of sound which just used to drive me absolutely nuts. Yeah. Exactly. But clicking, what is it? It is just, so basically you've got fluid between your joints known as synovial fluid, which is basically a lubricant. It's there to help with gliding, to help reduce pressure on the cartilage around it and everything like that. That's made up of mainly water and nitrogen. Obviously, nitrogen is a gas. Sometimes you get a buildup of a gas in there, which reduces a little bubble. And when you move a joint to the end range of motion, or you open the joint up, you can release that gas, and that can produce a clicking noise. And that is it. A lot of people worry it's causing, well, it's like cracking bones, or it's mm. damaging the joint, when actually, no, it's just releasing pressure from the joint. Hence why osteopaths, chiropractors will do sometimes manipulative techniques to free up a joint that may be restricted due to increased pressure. Yeah, and that process is called a very cool name, tribonucleation. Tribonucleation. Now, tribonucleation may not give you arthritis, but you know what it can do? What can it do, Gabs? It can reduce the amount of grip strength that you have. Prolonged, yeah, okay. yes. Can, yes. very so important word, can. Could. Can. <laughs> I don't know where I went with that there. Okay, why? So there's so I was looking into this and there are a lot of studies, no doubt, that got into like knuckle cracking because it's such a commonly asked question. And um, the reason why it's there's no so all studies have said there's no detrimental effects from clicking your fingers daily. There's actually a doctor who was told when he was younger by his mum, if you keep clicking your fingers, you're gonna get arthritis in your hands. From the age of 11 up until the age of 60, he cracked his left hand every single day and didn't crack his right hand. Left hand every day, didn't crack his right He cracked his right hand every day, didn't crack his left hand, that's it. Well, okay, he didn't crack one hand. Yeah, 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 yeah. And if you guys are watching on YouTube, you'll understand exactly what just happened and it, yeah. You could have just let me get away with it. Anyway, so yes, he cracked one hand, didn't crack the other. He had an x-ray at the age of 60 of both hands and they were both the same. There'd been no difference in the hands. There was no increased arthritic changes in the hand that he cracked every day. So, you know, that's proof to him. That's, yes, one occasion, yeah. but you know, he was sold on it. And then yes, there's been countless other studies that have shown it hasn't caused any changes. <clears throat> the, only de the only slight effect it could cause is yes, reduced grip strength to maybe due to increased joint mobility and uh, increased uh, ligament laxity as well. That's so that's it. probably one of the bigger ones uh, because with the recurring um, high velocity thrust within the joint cracking, yeah. let's say, let's just use um, just the word and the expression there, what it also does is it starts to release some hormones which then relax and then start to work on the structures around that joint mm. which then cause it to increase in the amount of mobility that it has. Yeah. Which, Again, it's pretty good. I mean, 
Again, that, and that's the difference. But that's that's that is clicking daily, every yeah. day. Yeah. If you go to your osteopath once a week, twice a week, that's or even fine. like once a month, ain't no way we're going to be causing that. Especially because probably if you come to see me, I'm not always going to be working on the same area. You're going to be working through the body. So. And also, quite importantly, we will actually be checking if it even needs the manipulation and before anything else. And that's the other thing. All people come and say, like, "Are you just going to crack like like people's expectations of osteopathy?" Sometimes are oh, like, oh, "Are you just going to click me around the table?" It's like, no. I mean, there are sessions where I don't do any HVTs because it's like this isn't necessary. This is purely a muscular problem, or we need to just rehab this area. And it's like, oh, oh, okay. Didn't know that. It's yeah. like, and then it opens the mind to, oh, wow, there's so much more than just clicking. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and actually, that's pretty big brain. Which then brings on to my next point. Oh, wow, are we look at using, you. Are we using just 10 or 20% of our brain? Because that's the current, the current kind of um, widely understood or what people like to spread around is that we're only using approximately like 7 to 20 percent of our brain is that true I love, I love the way that you do an accent for your general public <laughs> are we always using 70 percent of our brains maybe because that is how uh, presenters like to speak okay so. fact checked mm. sorry um thanks to scarlett johansson for creating the film lucy that's kind of bought into that saying we only used about 10 20 percent took a drug got into her blood system and she had access to 100 percent of her brain she was able to like transport places and move and work with computers and stuff like that and i think people are like wow would that be what life was really like if we could access 100 percent of our brains no because we can access 100 percent of our brain your body wouldn't be able to function if you couldn't access every part of your brain um, there are small segments of your brain for different functions um, the frontal lobe being probably the most one of the most interesting, because that's where you get your general kind of, um, well, in England, it would be your, your uh, manners, really, mm. your, a lot of your personality. Um, but yes, we do use all our brain. If I want to move my hand, I want to move my foot. If I want to think creatively, uh, if I want to think mathematically, I'm all using different parts of my brain for those functions. Yeah, and I mean, you've also got the part of uh, the brain around the front, which actually comes with the risk reward center, mm -hmm. which, um, um, I, I really always forget actually how it goes. OMPFC. Uh, the full name is Orf yeah, orbital medial prefrontal cortex. Yeah, which, I love it. Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. Tries to really understand whether what we're thinking of is it going to give us any good or is it going to give us any bad. Yeah. So with every single decision that you're doing, is it good or is it bad? Should I fall asleep? Should I look at my Instagram up until like two o'clock in the morning, just scrolling through um, some TikTok. memes? Yeah. yeah. So that all comes with these kind of things. Yeah. But at the same time, we know so much yet so little. Now, we don't exactly have a specific number as to how much we know about the brain, but as a kind of uh, rough estimate of you know, trying to put some sort of representative number behind how much we know about the brain, it's 0.0000001% because we don't know what we don't know. And I think that's where this myth comes from. You know, it's mm. not necessarily using our brain, it's how much do we understand about the brain? How do we, how do we understand about the neuro pathways that go on side? Because I, c I couldn't even tell you where to begin or where to start looking at with any of that stuff. Like, because it's because it's down to such a small detail. Obviously, I'm going to tell you about certain parts of the brain, how they function, where they go to supply. But it's so much deeper than that. Like yeah. if you speak to a neurologist, my mind literally blown. Nothing. We know nothing. And I mean, um, I mean, we're still discovering muscles in the body. Yeah, exactly. But I, I used to have a neuroanatomy uh, lecturer, uh, Dr. Francesco Contiero. Okay. Italian guy. I won't try and pronounce that. <laughs> yeah, it, it, it used to be, for a lot of people, quite painful because he used to have a very strong Italian accent. So trying to teach a very difficult subject whilst being Italian quick when you're speaking yeah. and with an accent, it was like... <gasps> so you were like flying in this class. I was, I loved it. I loved it so much. And uh, he, the more he was kind of blowing with this with this information at us the more we kind of went oh my god there is so much to learn mm. 
And he was sort of saying, we're merely just scratching the surface with all this. This it is it's it's insane. insane. It's insane. It's insane how much they remember. Yeah. yeah. And, you know, when you're using 100% of your brain, you start to really think, you know, it, it must overheat. You, you might need a bit of water for that. Oh, uh, you're on fire today. Absolute fire. I saw you look at the computer, see <laughs> what, what facts you're coming up with. And I can see you look, because I, I saw you do it for this one as well, with the brain one that you did. And I saw you look back at me and I could just tell you waiting for when we're going to switch subjects because you're like, I've got one. Yes, it does overheat. And yes, the common myth is, do we need eight glasses of water a day to stay hydrated? Not necessarily. No. no, no, it's completely dependent. One, um, from the factors within you, factors around you, how much are you eating, how much are you doing. If you're someone who's like four foot five, sedentary in lifestyle, uh, you don't exercise, you don't do much, you just eat, you're probably only going to need around five five yeah yeah compared to somebody who's six foot two incredibly active and is always on their feet you might need about ten does that make you feel happy it does I, I yeah. yeah 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 i'd say i've had at least two and a half liters of water today yeah no doubt you've got enough to fill a little bathtub don't you oh you don't make this a height thing <laughs> I'm five foot six. This is painful. Can we move on, please? <laughs> How many glasses of water do you need a day? I, I actually only need around five. Five glasses of water? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I don't drink that much. I don't drink that much. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm pretty bad. I'm pretty bad when it comes to it. That's not good. I, I used to be. And yeah. then I saw the change I had from drinking a lot more water. I felt more energetic. Mm. I actually recovered from injuries a lot quicker mm. because. You know, our bodies are, I think it's 75% water, so even more than 78, yeah, 73, yeah, approximately, 78. A bit higher, but approximately. And I mean, it's quite important because when you look at um, the human body from a physiological point of view, a lot of chronic illnesses derive from cellular dehydration. Yes. So when you start to think about what dehydration means, if you do suffer from chronic back pain, uh, chronic shoulder pain, Maybe you just need a little bit more water. Honestly, and like I always ask patients, how much water are you drinking? Yeah. And some some are literally like, oh, I just drink cups of tea or coffee. And it's like, actually, it's not the same anymore. No. Because no. The, its makeup is completely different. It doesn't enter the body in the same way. The body doesn't break it down the same way. And you actually need to maybe target it more water. And I've, I've had some patients where they literally do that, come back, and they're like, I feel so much better. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But on top of that, look, we are sort of saying one little factor behind chronic pain out of the hundred different factors. Yeah, that I'm not saying water's going to gonna kill you, so, hence why we have hospitals and yeah, medication yeah, as well. Yeah, like if you need ibuprofen, you need ibuprofen. If you've got diabetes, I'm not going to say you need 10 cups of water. Yeah, 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 exactly. Like I, I've got... That's uh, going to have your insulin up too. <laughs> I've got gout with pain on my toe. Water. <laughs> Drink more water. Which actually, you know what? <laughs> All doctors are Americans. Water. <laughs> Yeah, 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 pretty much. It is, uh, it's bad because it's so stereotypical, but uh, yeah, it's just, I'm sorry. I'm yeah, sorry. That's fair enough. It's fair enough. As I was coming here, actually, I got sent a video about Americans taking the mick out of English accents. So, you know, what? that time we got back. What? <laughs> what? 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 Um, we're talking about drinks. Let's talk about something that we eat. Oh. The common one is carrots. Do you like carrots? Uh, I occasionally do. I like it with a bit of hummus. Okay, but after you've eaten your carrots, Gabs, and you turn the lights off, can you see? Yeah, like ten times better. Okay, he's pulled a face that obviously says he's lying and he can't, but you cannot see any better <laughs> after eating carrots. Yes, no. and carrots contain carotene, which is vitamin A, which does actually help us um, help our eyes see light and create images in darker lighting. Helps us see better in darker, dimmer light not in pitch black, mm, mm, mm. but it doesn't actually help us with do you know, dark. Do you know where it kind of came from? Oh, I know exactly where it came from. Dude, before I was, wanted to be an osteopath, I wanted to be a history teacher. Oh yeah, that's so true. Oh my God. Yeah. So you're going to tell us about how this came from World War Yeah, it came, from, yeah, it came from uh, World War II, from uh, prisoners of war, Okay. captured by the Germans, by the enemy at the time. Mm -hmm. um, 
And at this point, the British had just come up with a radar, which that we used for all our air, our air battles, able to hunt down the enemy and shoot them down with incredible success to a point where the Germans didn't know what to do. So when we got when the British soldiers got captured, they'd interview, they'd question them, saying like, "How are you so good at shooting us down in the sky?" And they couldn't give away the fact we have radar because then they catch on to us and obviously create it themselves. So some of the soldiers just said, well, actually a lot of carrots helps me see in the dark because it did contain vitamin A. And at that time, not a lot of research had been done into it. And they would come, oh, wow, okay, let's do that. So a myth that was used to hide something so significant in the war is actually still told mm. as a bit of a wives' tale kind of yeah, thing. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, that, that's pretty cool. It wasn't because, you know, that the kids were just playing Call of Duty 24-7 at that time, was it? Dude, that ruined your eyes. <laughs> oh. And okay, sure. which which then brings on to a little bit of another myth. Oh, so God. does staring into the screen for a prolonged period of time actually affect your eyesight? It can affect your eyesight. Can? It can. There's, there's actually a study that I, I remember being shown and read back when I was at uni that said in Japan, people who live in the larger cities where there's lots of lights, actually led to chronic eye strain, chronic Vision, vision loss that even got passed down in the genetics. Mm. And the reason why is mainly because of the muscles within the eye. Mm. So what they do is they will help the dilation and the constriction, so opening and closing of the pupil. Yeah. The pupil is essentially the gap within the eye which allows enough light to go in which then registers all the images with the cones, vectors, and just trying to understand what that image is looking exactly, at. Exactly, yeah. So within that, if you're constantly using those muscles or underusing the mm. opposite side yeah. for a prolonged period of time, then you're going to start finding that these muscles get fatigued. Weaker, tired, strained. Yeah, yeah. So you just start finding that either your eyes get a bit lazy or you can't quite focus on specific things, <laughs> images or distance or pictures or writing, which is a very common one. Mm. So that's why... Uh, it's so important that we have these conversations with our patients who work a long time behind deaths, yeah. who get headaches, who get eye strain, who get all these things. Because as well, when your eyes become strained, it can also affect the muscles at the back of your skull, your suboccipital muscles, mm -hmm. and that can cause irritation to your occipital nerve, which causes headaches as well. So they're kind of linked. Quite a cool one was if you palpate the muscles at the back of the skull and you move your eyes, you can actually feel them moving. Yeah, I love that. I it's, love it's, that. It's a really creepy one. You're like, how is that working? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, but the key with it as well, if you've been staring at a screen for, I think it's every 20 minutes, you should look at something that is about two meters distance from your eyes, stare at it for at least 10 seconds, 20 seconds, and then, then go, go back, back to your screen because yeah. it readjusts your vision, reactivates muscles that haven't been used for a while. Kind of a lot like, you know, the postural exercises that we give to people in, 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 when they're in the office. You know, making sure that you're actually moving because it's not the prolonged, um, sorry, it's not the posture yeah. which causes the back pain or causes the postural issues, it's the prolonged exposure to just that specific posture without any movement. That's my favourite thing. That yeah. is like my favourite saying, I mean, we should get this put on a t-shirt or something. There's no such thing as bad posture. There's bad prolonged postures. Find it on Etsy. Just give us two weeks. Give us two weeks. You know, it's not the coolest shirt, though, is it? It's like, whoa. No. No bad blood, but, you know. But I reckon a lot of osteopaths are going to wear that around. I mean, I wear it to work. I well, could you imagine, like, you got it underneath your work shirt, and then, like, you just, like, rip up the upper shirt, and you got that underneath. That'd Maybe I just awesome. get it tattooed on my back. Speaking of tattoos on your back. <laughs> I haven't got a tattoo on my back. I want to get a massive dragon, or a picture of my face just smiling, like, Okay, we're gonna wait for that. But for the time being. I'm not doing it. <laughs> okay. Odds on. <laughs> Five. Did they actually get to the moon? Did they get to the moon with good posture? Let's keep this off to you. Uh, so the moon one's actually really interesting. Now it's more of a conspiracy theory. True, true. Less than a myth. Yeah. But some people think it is a myth. Yeah. You know. I'm not gonna lie, there was one moment of my life where I questioned it. Enlighten me. My stepdad, uh, okay. Lee, 
he is he he was around when they landed on the moon. He watched it on TV. He saw it and everything like that. And he's like, oh, do you guys believe in these conspiracy theories? And at that point, I was kind of like, yeah, maybe a little bit. Because you look at Area 51, I think it is, the aerial view looked exactly like the surface of the moon that was filmed on. You've looked at the flag and it's like, oh, it's waving, but there's no atmosphere and stuff like that. And, you know, you watch them walk on the moon, you're like, oh, it looks like it's just sped up skipping across the moon. Like, there's a couple of things where you're kind of like, oh, I don't know how much I can believe this. And why haven't we been back since? Yes, there's no reason. It's a race of Bruce, a waste of resources. But part of me did go, yeah, I don't think we did. But now I do think we do. I've been to NASA many a times and, you know, it's impressive. Mm. Um, but... But even when you look at the flag, because... So, yes, the, there may be no atmosphere, so it shouldn't exactly move, but there is still transference of energy. So when they were pressing the flag down, there is still going to be some sort of energetic potential that's being created by the movement of that flag being pressed down into the moon. So you're still going to get some sort of shaking from that. So what um, they kind of started to look at it. So they put two flags side to side in, in different recordings. One of them was in a vacuum and another was in just um, a normal field. Yeah. And the amount of movement of that flag was quite a number of times faster and more prolonged under atmospheric pressures than it was uh, atmospheric environments as it was in the vacuum environment. Okay. Okay, well, also they could have just put some metal rods in it to make it stand up straight. You know, I think that is literally what they did as well. They put some wires in the flag to make it look more wavy as maybe, well. So, maybe, maybe. well, I spoke to my, my friend who's an astrophysicist, and uh, he uh, then, when I told him, well, I doubted it at one point, he started saying, Next thing you know, you're going to tell me the Earth's flat. Is it not? I love watching that stuff. Ah, oh, same Mate, here, same here. I have spent hours on YouTube searching clips of people trying to prove the Earth is flat. It is my, sadly, it's one of my favourite pastimes of watching people try and prove the Earth isn't round. There was a programme where this individual who believed the Earth was round, he said, okay, so uh, looking at the calculation of the roundness of the Earth, if you were to put two uh, little, yeah. <laughs> little um, eye holes on two pieces of wood at a specific distance, the curvature should be felt to the point where if you look through that hole, mm. you should not be able to see um, the, the the object on the second plank. Yeah, so they were holding a light up, weren't they? So yeah. they were doing it like the hole was at chest height. Yeah. And so the fences would have to be held at chest height. So yeah. for the world to be proved it was curved, he had to hold the light over his head and then they'd be able to see it to prove the world's curved. Mm, mm. But if the world was flat, he'd hold it at chest height and it wouldn't be. Yeah, and, and like, what happened cool. was uh, they went through with the experiment and he's holding the light there and he's like, okay, now switch it on. And they switch on the light and he's like, you got it switched on, man? They're like, yeah, 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 we got it. They're on the, they're on the walkie talkie. Yeah, 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 we got it switched on. I don't see it. <laughs> it's the voice that did it first. It's like, oh, that's a, we still can't see it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh. Hmm. Put it above your head. <laughs> <laughs> and that's when they discovered that the earth was indeed not flat. Because the light just comes up straight away and you could just, and it, the guy just goes, Oh, oh no. no. <laughs> <laughs> it just, it just this cuts. sudden realization <laughs> is so good. It's such so a good. satisfying moment uh -huh. as well. Because I'm just like, Yes! <laughs> so. Going back to the moon like, landing. The moon landing. Oh, so okay. when they did have the interview with Buzz Aldrin. Oh, so we're talking at the age of seventy-two in the nineteen in yeah, two thousand two. That was yeah. And well, what kind of happened in that interview? Could so, you remind us? Yeah. So the moon landing nineteen sixty-nine. The start nineteen seventies. Rumors started spreading that it was all fake and it's all lies and. Everyone is just a military member who'd been told to lie just because they wanted to beat Russia to the moon. So a lot of people bought into this one, like, yeah, they're all a bunch of liars. So in the 2002 interview with Buzz Aldrin, um, basically, sorry, Buzz Lightyear is named after Buzz Aldrin. No way. Way. Um, they literally, the, the interviewer was like, say, like getting, calling him a coward for, for continuing to lie, apparently lie about landing on the moon. 
Buzz Aldrin, 72 years old, his response was stand up, walk across the room and punch the guy directly in the jaw. Now, I don't condone so violence. <laughs> oh, okay. <laughs> uh, I don't condone violence too. But when it comes to the moon landing on the moon. Yeah, yeah. The I guy's mean, kind of a hero. But also, on top of that, you spent, you know, so many years training and it, it's bloody scary to go off to the moon. You're in this literally controlled bomb. Garbage can. Going to the moon. And someone's come up to you and gone, you did not go to the moon. I'm sorry, but I'm, I'd be pretty angry too. Uh, honestly, I'd be, I'd, be, I'd, be, I'd be furious. I'd be like, it's like, it's like small things. Like if you tell a joke and somebody then says it later and you're kind of like, I came up with that. And then somebody goes like, no, they didn't. It's like, what? Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. <laughs> I told it first. <laughs> like, oh, key and peel, key and peel. See, oh, that's so good. I can't, what? Oh, there's so many. There's so many ones. Hypotenuse? No. Uh, anyways, we are not going to go into that. Really Ladies funny. and gentlemen, this is the end of Mythbusters episode two, but episode six of Mind the Bad Trance. It is. We wish you a great week. Yeah. And we'll see you next week. Where we'll be discussing. You'll have to find out. TBC, baby. Ciao for now. Ciao for now.